from Psalm 91. For thou, Lord, art my hope, and thou hast set to thine house of defense very high. There shall no evil happen unto thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last night, I put James to sleep, which is something that I remember looking forward to from the very first time we found out Chloe was pregnant with him. I'm a very ritualistic person, if you can't tell. And so I, I was thinking through, even before he was born, what, what's, what's, what's my bedtime ritual going to be? What does bedtime with the dad look like? And so I settled on something that I've done since the first time I put him to bed. I do the exact same thing every time. We read a book. Last night it was, if you give a mouse a cookie. And then I pray Psalm 91, and I say the Our Father, and I say a final blessing before I place him in his crib and kiss him goodnight. Psalm 91 was an intentional choice. It is the psalm appointed for Compline, but it's also a very fitting thing to pray before one enters into the darkness of the night and everything that that entails, all the things associated with that. Let me tell you why. If you were here last month when uh, Father Peter Anthony from England came and preached, he opened his sermon with a story about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they were discovered. If you remember, there were were shepherds out in caves near Qumran, and they were trying to find their sheep that had wandered off, so they were throwing stones in caves, thinking they'll scare the sheep, they'll be able to hear it, and then they can go and, and rescue it, trying to save some time. And when they threw a stone into one of these caves, they heard it smash a piece of pottery. And there were jars with manuscripts of the Old Testament, of various Jewish writings and scriptures dating from the 3rd century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. It was the most important, the largest discovery of biblical archaeological manuscripts of its time. And it remains to this day perhaps the most important finding of manuscripts ever. It really helped us understand at the time of Jesus, which is when these manuscripts were dated to, what were people talking about? What were people interpreting the scriptures as? When Jesus goes to the synagogue, what are they saying? What are they thinking? It really helped us get into the mindset of the people when the time of our Lord, when in the time of our Lord. In some of these fragments, we learned about demonic possession and activity in particular. How was our Lord discussing demons? When he was going around doing exorcisms, what were people thinking of this? And what we learn is that they were uh, explaining demonic activity in one of two ways. The most extreme form was possession, which was the complete takeover of your body and mind. You lose control of your own being. That was demonic possession. But there was another form, a bit more minor, more common, demonic harassment. And harassment was something that every single person would experience. It would come in all sorts of varieties, uh, trials, temptations, sicknesses, all sorts of things were attributed to demonic harassment in our life. The solution for possession was an exorcism. And that's something we see our Lord doing repeatedly throughout the scriptures. For harassment, however, there was a a variety of prescriptions, of things that could be done to limit the influence of demons in our lives. In one of these caves in Qumran, a jar containing four psalms titled Songs to Disperse Demons was found. They were incantations of sorts, set apart prayers for a specific purpose, to ward off demonic influence. Three of these psalms you won't find in our Bible or Book of Common Prayer. They were psalms that we didn't know existed until we found them in this cave. The fourth psalm was Psalm 91, meaning that in the time of our Lord, Psalm 91 was one of these incantation psalms, something that would be repeated by people time and time again to ward off demonic presence in their life. Now, don't think of it like a a magical rock or amulet that you carry around. You say Beetlejuice three times and something crazy happens. 
These were, were prayers. They were prayers that would call upon the name of the Lord against evil powers. And the name of the Lord is the best protection you could ever have against these. And so it was a way to, to recognize that. Why Psalm 91 specifically? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and I don't want to bore you, so let me give you the thousand-foot view. Psalm 91 has lots of Hebrew words that are references to the false Canaanite gods of the time. Plague, pestilence, hunger, arrows. These were all words and even names of false gods, which were thought to be demons, of the nations around Israel. Psalm 91 is essentially uh, God bragging, saying, you don't have to worry about him or him or him or him or any of those false gods or demons, because I am greater than them. You shall call upon the name of the Lord and he will deliver you. Remember which psalm Satan tries to use to harass Jesus in the wilderness. It's this one. It's Psalm 91. This psalm from its inception has been associated with demonic harassment, with the powers of evil, and with the proclamation of the name of the Lord over and against them. Now, to be clear, Psalm 91 is not a promise that believers will never suffer illness or hardship. When COVID came around, I remember people posting this, you shall not be afraid of any evil plague, and then they got COVID. So it's not this magical spell that protects us from suffering and hardship. It's a way of aligning our heart, our soul, and our mind to the God of Israel, the one true God, so that you are never seduced by the lies of the demons. So that when their plagues or arrows or pestilences come your way, when their harassment comes upon you, you don't have to stand there and be fearful. They're not going to drag you away from the one true God. So why does any of this matter for us today? These themes, I think, help remind us of the spiritual reality that is all around us. And most importantly, they remind us that the story of Jesus Christ, the cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection, and the ascension are not just physical marvels. They're not one-time events. They are pivotal moments in the cosmic struggle between good and evil where Christ's victory over sin, death, and all demonic powers is secured once and for all. Salvation is about more than just a ticket to heaven. It's about your place in the world, your loyalty to the one true God, the God of Israel, and his power and authority over all powers of darkness. Understanding this spiritual battle that the demons wage helps us frame the way we see the glorification of Jesus Christ. And so when we come to our gospel today, and we see those two sons of Zebedee, James and John, seeking places of glory beside Jesus, we start to understand the deeper picture, the more far-reaching goal that Christ has in mind that James and John don't quite realize yet. Now, they're not stupid. They're starting to understand that, that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And the verses prior to our gospel today, Christ says he's on his way to Jerusalem so that in three days his glorification would come to pass. They know his glorification is imminent. They long for the promised one to take his rightful place on the throne. But I think their perception of Christ's ascent to glory is still warped a bit. It's still wrapped up in the ways of the world. I'm not sure they fully understand the the cosmic significance of what is about to take place. And so our Lord's response to them is basically, you don't know what you're talking about. By asking for this, you don't realize that you're also asking for suffering. Because my glorification and my suffering go hand in hand. He rebukes their presumption, but it also gives Jesus an opportunity to to explain what's about to happen in a little more detail. He's not just usurping power for a particular group of people in a particular area in a particular moment in time. He's going to tackle the depths of sin and evil. He's going to take on all of our suffering and shame, and he's going to usher in a new creation that reaches back into the past, establishes something in the present, and secures something in the future. Nobody can be unaffected by this event, not those in hell, not the demons, not the angels, nor any of us. 
And so all three of our readings today, apart from Psalm 91, are grounded in this idea of our salvation, in this idea of Jesus Christ as the ransom, the propitiation, the offering, the perfect sacrifice for all of us. He is our great high priest, as the author of Hebrews puts it. He is our perfect offering to the Father. And so when the demons attack us with their weapons, which are not physical but spiritual, Christ responds not by fighting them, but by offering his own life to them. He defeats the demons not by confronting them head on, but by actually tricking them into think, thinking they've won. They think that they've killed the Son of God, and for a brief moment, they rejoice. Before the cross, these powers held sway over humanity through sin and death. But by dying and paying the penalty for sins, Christ undoes their power by actually exposing them as frauds. The power of the demons lies in their ability to, to twist and distort the truth, to make us doubt the goodness and order of God's creation. Remember all the way at the beginning, in Genesis 1, when the serpent, when Satan first appears, what does he say? Did God really say, you shall not eat of this tree? Did God really say, you might die? They take Scripture, they take the truths from God, and they twist them and give them back to us as the truth. That morphed reality is presented to us as the only option. And things like Psalm 91 were a way of resisting these false realities by reminding us that God's truth remains unshaken, despite the lies, despite the deceptions of demonic forces. If you remember a few weeks ago, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, Father Steve preached on the power of the spiritual forces of darkness and how they don't fight with physical weapons, but they fight with words with messages. Their message is that we are powerless over them. Their message is that they can give us the power and joy that we crave. Their message to us is the exact same message they give Jesus in the wilderness. Bow down to me. Accept my version of reality. Worship me, and I will give you the power and prestige that you crave. And they are right to a certain extent. We are powerless over them. When it is us against them, we have every right to be afraid. But it's not us against them. And this is part of that twist that they have done. This is part of that warped reality that they have created, tricking us into thinking that we battle alone, tricking us into thinking when suffering and pain come our way that we are by ourselves enduring it. Christ's exaltation after the resurrection is a sign of his ultimate and complete victory and authority over the spiritual realm, where even the demons are subject to him. The glorification of Christ that he speaks of in the gospel today, it's like the rug being pulled out from under the demons and Satan. They think they've won until the rug is pulled from underneath them and they are exposed for what they are, frauds and powerless. We have no reason to fear not because I have power over them, but because Christ has exposed them, because Christ has done what I could not. Psalm 91, once used as a prayer of protection against demonic harassment, now finds its ultimate fulfillment in the cosmic victory of Jesus Christ, a victory that you and I are invited to share in. And so when we pray Psalm 91 today, and I encourage you to go home and pray before bedtime tonight, we are not just asking for a temporary protection against demonic influence. We're proclaiming something. We're proclaiming Christ's triumph over sin, death, and every power that seeks to do us harm. In him we find our true refuge. We find freedom from fear and harassment by the powers of darkness. We proclaim that the world itself has been recreated, that a new creation has been ush ushered in, and that creation proclaims the glory of its creator. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation, there shall no evil happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, you shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. 
I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 